For men in war, death is an ever-present possibility and terror. Soldiers who experienced near-death encounters suggest that death may not be something to be feared. At what point does life fade into death? Is it possible to scientifically prove that there is life after life? This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. During the 11 long years that America was involved in the Vietnam War, over 57,000 men died in combat. There were more than 300,000 wounded. The line between life and death was, for these men, very narrow. In the case of one of those soldiers, Tommy Clack, Vietnam is more than just a hellish memory. Tommy, now an administrator at Atlanta's Veterans Hospital, encountered a life-after-life -life experience that remains very real. I was a captain in the Army. In particular, my job was that of a, what's called a forward observer. I called in artillery and plane strikes and gunships and, and was actually the person that directed us from point A to B by reading the map and coordinates and knowing where we are at all times. But uh, at one particular morning, uh, May 29, 1969 to be exact, we ended up in a big firefight. of that action, I got hit by one of the incoming rounds we had coming in. I was conscious the whole time when I got hit. I, I remember flying through the air, and I remember coming down, and I sat up, and I looked down, and I saw that, that I was missing my right arm and my right leg, and my left leg was, was laying off to the side like it was broke. I had several puncture wounds over my body that I was bleeding from, and I saw everybody run around, I laid back down, and you know, uh, from that point forward, I guess I really started thinking about the fact that, you know, my time had come. I really was going to die. I heard no more battle sound. I didn't feel anything. There was no pain. And I, I felt this calm come over my body as I was laying there. But then the battle subsided, and they got in a medevac helicopter. And I remember that I was laying there on the ground. They, they put this poncho over me. Like, the only time we put ponchos over people were when they were dead. And I guess for the first time, and I had no comprehension of what length of time this was, I, I realized that I was, I was dead. I wasn't alive. I wasn't, I wasn't functioning as a human being anymore. And all of a sudden, I realized that, that I wasn't just visualizing this from the ground. I was looking down and seeing this go on. I don't ever remember leaving my body, quote, and it was really a weird experience because it was, there was no emotions. There, there, was, there was nothing. It was just total peace and tranquility, and all of us, I just realized I didn't exist anymore. Typical field procedure dictated that the mortally wounded be airlifted to the nearest possible field hospital. Tommy was rushed to the 25th Division Headquarters Hospital near Kuchi, some 20 miles from the battlefield. One of the things that, that you learn real fast in Vietnam when you have a lot of casualties is that people have priority over other people depending on your wounds. Now, realistically, if I had been in charge, somebody in my condition, I probably would have given a low priority due to the extent of the injuries. 
But for some reason, a doctor came over and lifted the poncho up. I saw him do it very clearly. And all of a sudden, I had a group of people on me trying to, to, to do whatever it is they were trying to do to me. They lifted me up and took me into the operating room. I saw them cut my clothes off. Uh, I saw them start IVs. I didn't feel any remorse or anything. It, it was just total peace and nothing for what was laying there that was my body. But then all of a sudden, I left that operating room, and it was almost like a, a blink of the eyes, and I was back at the battlefield where I had gotten injured. And at that particular time, I think is when I come to realize I really was dead because everybody in Vietnam that I had put in plastic bags, when somebody got killed, you put them in a plastic bag, uh, were right there with me. I, they were around me. Jeff and Mark and all these guys were right there with me, and we communicated like we were talking with our minds. And I was above the earth, and it was a gigantic brightness that surrounded the whole battlefield uh, that was just pure peace. Ten days later, I woke up, and I was laying in a bed in Kuchi, Vietnam, and I did not have to ask what went on. I, I remember everything that went on. I knew I was missing the limbs, I, I didn't realize they had cut my left leg off in the operating room. It was beyond repair. Uh, but I told the doctor everything that had gone on, what they had done to me, that I had been covered up. Uh, and even a couple of the guys that, that lived through the battle with me stopped by, and I told them who had gotten killed that day. And, and there was no way for me to know that, except that I had been with them. Uh, wherever we were, whatever that place was, whatever it was, uh, we were there together because we were all dead. Was Tommy indeed dead? How can we explain his profound and mysterious experience? If Tommy Clack had been a soldier during World War II, he probably would have died. The high-level technology of modern medicine saved his life and made it possible for him to recount his out-of-body experience. It is ironic, however, that the same sophisticated medical devices which were used to keep Tommy alive also make it more difficult to determine exactly when death occurs. At the Veterans Hospital in Atlanta, physicians like Dr. Michael Sabin continually grapple with pinpointing the precise instant at which a human life ceases. The definition of death is very nebulous, both medically and legally. There is no one generally accepted definition of when the point of death occurs. I can't give you in ten words or less how we determine how somebody is dead. Sometimes it's obvious uh, from uh, examining the patient that there's no pulse, no heartbeat, and uh, rigor mortis is set in so that the patient is obviously dead. But when you're talking about uh, lack of vital signs, uh, a, a cardiac uh, arrhythmia or irregularity of the heartbeat which would not support blood pressure, unconsciousness, all of these types of definitions that have been used in the past uh, can be, uh, there are exceptions to these at the present time, so it becomes difficult to establish medically, physically, and scientifically when the exact point of physical death occurs. What is the precise moment that death occurs? Researchers are only now beginning to probe the depths of near death and a person's ability to return from that level of consciousness. As with most medical research, the investigation begins with laboratory animals. We are cooling our experimental animal, rat, to about the temperature of about 10 or 5 degrees centigrade, which is about 45 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Dr. Vozin Popovich of Emory University School of Medicine uses a cooling process in an attempt to define the instant of death. When the body temperature decreases, to such a low body temperature, metabolic processes, heart rate, respiration, everything slows down and eventually stops. So the animal now looks dead. The animal is clinically dead, but it is not biologically dead. That means all clinical signs of death appear present, but the animal is still alive. After two hours, we could still recover that animal by rewarming. After three hours, we cannot because we now pass the point of biological death. The point of biological death is passed and the animal is dead. With the success that Dr. Popovich has had in freezing and reviving rats, it seems likely that the same could be done to humans. Some human bodies have been purposely frozen immediately after death. 
there has been at least one unsuccessful resuscitation attempt. An accident in Canada provided researchers with an unusual opportunity to try to revive a frozen boy. His story begins to unlock the secrets of that special place between life and death. It was a cold evening in January 1976 in an area near Winnipeg, Canada. The temperature had dropped from a brisk 32 degrees Fahrenheit to nearly 40 below. Ted Milligan, then 16, was a member of the St. John Cathedral School. Part of the curriculum included a 27-mile cross-country snowshoe hike. Ted set out on his assignment along with a number of his classmates. Only a few miles from the end of the hike, however, Ted collapsed into unconsciousness. His colleagues, unable to move him in the intense cold, returned to their school for help. Dr. James Bristow, an expert on human frostbite, freezing, and cardiopulmonary resuscitation, attempted to revive Ted. The lad was uh, clinically dead. There was no heartbeat. The cardiogram showed a flat line on the cardioscope indicating asystole. He was, of course, not breathing. And uh, his body temperature was very cold to touch. And in fact, uh, the temperature as recorded by a low reading thermometer was uh, 25 degrees Celsius, the normal being about 37 degrees. Ted Milligan's heart had stopped beating for over two and a half hours. Dr. Bristow worked over Ted's body for nearly another two hours. Conventional medical textbooks state that without oxygen for more than four and a half minutes, a body will suffer irreparable brain damage and will die. Yet Ted regained consciousness and was perfectly normal. Ted Milligan, now a private in the Canadian Armed Forces, recalls his ordeal. Well, mainly it was just like being asleep, like a total, total darkness and waking up out of a sleep that you didn't know that you had gone into. I'm not afraid of dying. When I die, I'm going to die, and I'll probably die with a smile on my face. Biological death basically means brain death, irreversible brain death, as uh, opposed to clinical death, which is simply the lack of vital signs, heartbeat and respiration. These episodes, and, and such as Ted's, has focused on and brought a more awareness to the fact that there can be a great discrepancy between clinical death and biological death in in some instances and notably accidental hypothermia is one of these where in fact an individual could be written off and and could be given up as being clinically dead only to have the brain still intact the brain cell still intact and capable of being resuscitated which is the important thing Ted Milligan's experience seems to indicate that there is no fine line between life and death. Perhaps it's a broad expanse through which a person moves simply and logically from one state to another. What happens when this process is interrupted by modern medicine and a person who has been gliding toward death is revived? Fred Schoonmaker, a doctor of cardiology at St. Luke's Hospital in Denver, has had repeated experiences bringing patients back from death-like states. Their accounts of life-after-life -life experiences were so numerous and similar that Dr. Schoonmaker was intrigued by the phenomena. The first questions that began to come to my mind is, is that could this in some way be a dream-like state? Could this in some way be hallucination? If you take a person, for example, who's hallucinating, if you take a person who may be in DTs from withdrawal from a drug dependency problem, they're seeing pink elephants, they're seeing uh, white rats, red rats, whatever it may be, but this is a terrifying experience to them. It was an unreal when they became back into and, and filtered back into the mainstream of life after being hospitalized over a period of time and rehabilitated. These kind of vivid expressions that they had either in dream states or hallucinatory states or if they were on any kind of drug medications for decreasing uh, pain or whatever, they knew they were not real. They were unreal. And the word that began to pass through many of these people as we talked back and forth was, this was a real experience that I had. I don't know what it was, 
but it indeed was real. Schoolmaker discovered that those who have had life after life experiences are profoundly changed. Unlike most of us, they no longer fear death. I found that people who have not really come to grips with their own feelings about death are not very well equipped to live. Janet Rainwater's encounter with death occurred in 1952. The doctor said I had flu, but there was a polio epidemic going on, and I became gradually aware that I had polio, and finally went for a spinal tap, and they said, okay, you'd better go to Variety Children's Hospital. By the time Janet had reached the hospital, she could barely walk. As recreated for In Search Of, each step jarred her already excruciatingly painful spine. She lost her ability to swallow and encountered incredible difficulties in breathing. Finally, her arms and legs became totally paralyzed. Janet lost consciousness and began drifting between life and death. Well, the next thing I knew, I was walking across this dry riverbed. And in the distance, there was this marvelous, marvelous white light. And I could hardly wait to, to, to go into it. It was so peaceful and calm. I was incredibly happy. And then I became aware of some women. I felt they were calling to me, but I kind of said, go away, don't bother me. Because I really wanted to go into the light. And then I realized that one of them, at least, was calling me Mary. And that startled me, because that's the name I was called the first 10 years of my life. And for 20 years, no one had called me by that name. So then I paid more attention, and I realized it was my grandmother. She had died two years before, and she was someone who I'd loved very, very, very much. And then I realized, if I was there with my grandmother, I must be dead. And I said to her, Grammy, if we're here together, you're dead. That means I must be dead, too. And she said, that's right. And then the next thing I knew, it was like I had total knowledge, as if someone had put a computer printout in my brain. I saw the results of all the actions and inactions I'd ever taken in my life. And surprisingly, there were no black marks for anything I'd done. I had lots of black marks for things I hadn't done. I said to my grandmother, it's too soon. I can't be dead. I've got to go back. And she said, well, you can go back, but leave right now and don't look at the light anymore. And I didn't even pause to decide. I just turned around and started back across the riverbed. And that went very quickly. But then I came to this practically vertical sand bank, and I started climbing up it. But I couldn't get really good handholds, and I would fall back down and I'd work some more and climb some more, and I'd fall back down. But finally, I made it up, and I just fell back, exhausted on the top of this sand dune. And the next second, I woke up, whatever you want to call it, and I was in my own body, and I could breathe, and I could swallow, which was incredible, because I hadn't swallowed for three or four days. Someone came in the room almost immediately, and I could tell they were really surprised that how well I was doing, and uh, I said, I can swallow. Uh, give me some water, I want to prove it. A little bit later, they brought me a bowl of turkey broth. This was dawn, it was Thanksgiving Day. And uh, Thanksgiving Day has always been a very special day for me. It's Christmas and Easter and everything else rolled into one. I'm not afraid of death. I know it's a beautiful experience that when it comes to be my time, I'm going to really look forward to it. No one is sure what the near-death experience really is. But the message from those who have encountered it and returned is that death should not be feared. They suggest that what is to come is simply life after life. We cannot say for sure that the life after life experience is actually death itself. Obviously, however, it does alter our perceptions of life and the hereafter. Based on the experiences that we've heard from those who have had the near-death 
experience. This has influenced my concept of a God that makes him far greater, far more merciful, far more loving than I'd ever conceived of him to be before. Dr. Lauren Young is an eminent theologian and scholar. His experiences with those who have had life after life encounters have given him new religious insights. Or have been under the influence of the light who have really come into a personal encounter with this image of mercy and love come back into this world with a totally different attitude. And to me, this is a solid encounter, an exquisite expression of what it really means to come face to face with God. If we could remove from society a major fear, there's a tremendous contribution. Death is a major fear. Those who've experienced it are no longer afraid of life or death. Lost civilizations, extraterrestrials, myths and monsters, missing persons, magic and witchcraft, unexplained phenomena. In search of cameras are traveling the world seeking out these great mysteries. This program was the result of the work of scientists, researchers, and a group of highly skilled technicians. not necessarily the only ones to the mysteries we will examine. During the 11 long years that America was involved in the Vietnam War, over 57,000 men died in combat. There were more than 300,000 wounded. The line between life and death was, for these men, very narrow. In the case of one of those soldiers, Tommy Clack, Vietnam is more than just a hellish memory. Tommy, now an administrator at Atlanta's Veterans Hospital, encountered a life-after-life -life experience that remains very real. I was a captain in the Army. In particular, my job was that of what's called a forward observer. I called in artillery and plane strikes and gunships and, and was actually the person that directed us from point A to B by reading the map and coordinates and knowing where we are at all times. But uh, at one particular morning, uh, May 29, 1969 to be exact, we ended up in a big firefight. I saw him cut my clothes off. Uh, I saw him start IVs. I didn't feel any remorse or anything. It, it was just total peace and nothing for what was laying there that was my body. But then all of a sudden, I left that operating room, and it was almost like a, a blink of the eyes, and I was back at the battlefield where I had gotten injured. And at that particular time, I think is when I come to realize I really was dead, because everybody in Vietnam that I had put in plastic bags, when somebody got killed, you put them in a plastic bag, uh, were right there with me. I, they were around me. Jeff and Mark and all these guys were right there with me and we communicated like we were talking with our minds. And I was above the earth and it was a gigantic brightness that surrounded the whole battlefield uh, that was just pure peace. Ten days later, I woke up and I was laying in a bed in Kuchi, Vietnam. And I did not have to ask what went on. I, I remember everything that went on. I knew I was missing the limbs, I, I didn't realize they had cut my left leg off in the operating room. It was beyond repair. Uh, but I told the doctor everything that had gone on, what they had done to me, that I had been covered up. Uh, and even a couple of the guys that, that lived through the battle with me stopped by, and I told them who had gotten killed that day. And I mean, I had no comprehension of what length of time this was. I, I realized that I was, I was dead. I wasn't alive. I wasn't, I wasn't functioning as a human being anymore. And all of a sudden, I realized that 
that I wasn't just visualizing this from the ground. I was looking down and seeing this go on. I don't ever remember leaving my body, quote, and it was really a weird experience because it was, there was no emotions. There, there, was, there was nothing. It was just total peace and tranquility, and all of a, I just realized I didn't exist anymore. Typical field procedure dictated that the mortally wounded be airlifted to the nearest possible field hospital. Tommy was rushed to the 25th Division Headquarters Hospital near Kuchi, some 20 miles from the battlefield. One of the things that, that you learn real fast in Vietnam when you have a lot of casualties is that people have priority over other people depending on their wounds. Now, realistically, if I had been in charge, somebody in my condition, I probably would have given a low priority due to the extent of the injuries. But for some reason, a doctor came over and lifted the poncho up. I saw him do it very clearly. And all of a sudden, I had a group of people on me trying to, to, to do whatever it is they were trying to do to me. They lifted me up and took me into the operating For men in war, death is an ever-present possibility and terror. Soldiers who experienced near-death encounters suggest that death may not be something to be feared. At what point does life fade into death? Is it possible to scientifically prove that there is life after life? This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanation. Through the course of that action, I got hit by one of the incoming rounds we had coming in. I was conscious the whole time when I got hit. I, I remember flying through the air, and I remember coming down, and I sat up, and I looked down, and I saw that, that I was missing my right arm, my right leg, and my left leg was, was laying off to the side like it was broke. I had several puncture wounds over my body that I was bleeding from, and I saw everybody run around, I laid back down, and you know, uh, from that point forward, I guess I really started thinking about the fact that you know, my time had come. I really was going to die. I heard no more battle sound, I didn't feel anything, there was no pain, and I, I felt this calm come over my body as I was laying there. But then the battle subsided, and they got in a medevac helicopter, and I remember that I was laying